Well, I'm finally out in a national park um, or, or a nature reserve, a pretty big one. Actually just parked up here and you can see there's been a forest fire not too long ago, but long enough ago that new growth is coming through, but it's spread for quite a way. But nice view in the background there from that cliff edge. You can actually hike up there. I've been there once before, but I'm just gonna take the anti-roll bar off the sway bar, let the tire pressure down, make these dirt tracks a bit more comfy and then find somewhere to pitch camp. Once upon a time I used to have a tyre pressure gauge and then I left it on top of the tyre and drove away in the snow, crushed it and then when I came back it was gone anyway. So now I just kind of listen to the air and you get this like whistle sound on every tyre and then after that I just put the, put the cap back on and that's generally around about sort of 15 psi for me. It seems to be pretty accurate. Um, in the winter on the snow I do go as low as 4 on the beadlocks, 4 psi, but you know, you kind of need the flotation when it's real deep. But anyway, let's get going. Doing a bit of hiking off the beaten track. Found a trail, a uh, sort of old forest road that goes all the way here to the bottom of this cliff. It's quite nice actually, real nice spot. And uh, yeah, I definitely come, can't come up this far though. But I was wondering whether it would be somewhere I could um, sort of hike to and set the tent up at a later date. I kind of know where I want to go and I can't explore too much because the price of diesel is killing me. But uh, this place is amazing, just scoping the area out with the old binos. Seeing who's up there. Sometimes you think you can hear voices, but it's just the sound of the river. Or is it? First snake I've seen in Sweden. Really beautiful snake. You can see it just there. I'm not going to disturb it too much because it's just going to kind of get pissed off. And it is venomous. Beautiful location, kind of shielded behind the Jeep because I can't quite show you it in its uh, entirety but I have taken a pano so you can have a look at the lay of the land. The wind's howling so that's kind of why I'm cowered behind the Jeep or else the microphone gets a bit distorted but I keep hearing noises though. I swear to God I keep hearing voices like screams and like, you know, it was like a woman's voice like, ah, yeah, there, yeah, you know, sort of noises and it's probably just Bigfoot. Just, he's just trying to lure me into the forest. He's just, he's just mucking around. He's always doing that. What's that? New suspension. I've just leveled the vehicle a little bit. Just say the draw system at the back's kind of level. So like the platforms are level when I'm cooking and stuff. It doesn't matter about the awning rooms, you can adjust the poles, but. And it's a nice position now, because um, there's no wind here. So I can obviously cook and have a decent time with that. There we go. 
is a really useful uh, room this in the winter with the diesel heater I've only ever done one video where I've shown that although I've used it a few times and um, I've always been pretty happy with it it's been, been, been a good room it's not really thick but it's, it's thick enough to hold the heat but uh, probably get this thing pegged out pretty fast this wind's picking up So here we are, home sweet home. This is going to be my uh, bedroom for the next few nights and uh, it is pretty comfortable actually, it's nice. It's nice you, you can stand up in it, you have a great view out the windows too and then you can batten down the hatches in the evening if you want to. Um, I probably will because the weather's kind of lame this summer but um, I like one thing about it and that's like an access um, inside the doors and stuff here without uh, kind of going out that door all the time so one thing I really need is this just to do a little bit of spring cleaning in here as it's been in the garage for over a year Another thing is the bedding, which is right here. So it works out kind of well, for not having to go outside all the time. And if you need to retreat into the vehicle because Jimmy Savile, or I mean, um, a bear comes, then uh, you know you'll be all right, maybe. This is my sleep gear, and I've got some duplication on board. So this is the uh, the sleep gear you would have seen me use in the old rooftop tent. But now I just use it when I'm at camp and I'm sleeping in the awning room, um, or Meg uses it, for example. Although she refuses to sleep in the awning room, she likes the Coleman um, Kobuck because it's a blackout tent. And I get that because it is really tough for, for Max to sleep out here when it's daylight all the time. He just doesn't understand, and he'll wake up at like two three in the morning and he won't go back to sleep so um you know until he's older and he gets that it's just easier for them to be in the coleman Kobuck on this sort of gear here and then i usually sleep in my my backpacking gear which i've got in the back of the car in that sort of synthetic lk35 replica that i've got in the back there so i've got sort of duplicates on board stuff for hiking if i leave the vehicle and i go off which is unlikely over these next few days because i want to be here um, but I've got this stuff here so I can be in comfort if I want to be. That's what I tell myself. Basically, I've gone soft. I've spent too many years kind of sleeping on the ground and eating dog shit and bugs. And, um, you know, now I want a double bed when I'm out camping. And I want a vehicle and I want a kitchen and stuff. It is the truth, you know. I'm almost 40 years old. This is a super comfy double mat. It's great in the winter too it does crazy cold temps it's got foam in it and obviously um air pockets and things and it's self-inflating so i'm just going to leave this here you don't even actually really need to inflate it just leave it here and uh let it do its thing and it should be good to go and by the time i get to bed it should have inflated itself enough to be uh, a decent layer but yeah i think i'll sleep there tonight just keep that locked up till later or else all the dirt's going to get in but that should be Pretty comfy bed. Oh man, I could get to sleep already. I'm tired. It's probably because I'm hungry. Been driving all day, exploring, done a bit of hiking, not not too far, but went went in that little valley, tried to look for more snakes and stuff, but man, it was boggy as hell. And there were mozzies everywhere. But uh, definitely a cool place to go back and camp in the uh, in the winter or in in the autumn. Be a beautiful location. Not too close to the cliff. <laughs> Someone will probably take a dump off the edge and take me out.
a little bit of rain coming in, so uh, just going to get the food out and the milk for the tea. Jesus, I'm dying for a cup of tea. That's it, might have a bit of chocolate as well. Try not to eat all of it. I have to tell my friend when he comes tomorrow to bring some supplies, maybe. M more chocolate is what I'm talking about, basically. Rice, seasoning, some gas. Use that one. Tea bags. And that's it, I think. Got some pretty good stuff for tomorrow. Got some pancakes. Whoa, tundred. The best. It's going to be great. Bit of rain. Didn't expect that. Let that warm up. Save the hot water for later. <laughs> oh, he's the clever one. We're gonna have a Yorkshire tea. They're in short supply, but oh, the potency. You don't understand, but some of you do. Some of you do. So that's it, tea for the day. Well, hot water as well. So if you do some cooking with rice or something, pretty useful to then be able to just already have almost hot water to save some fuel. So I shall pop that there and pray it doesn't explode. And uh, that should be that. Decent. It's like a spray tan compared to Lipton's. Mopped up some of the grease. This water is already very hot as well. Obviously if it was very cold water, this would be pretty dodgy. I'm just gonna tank this up with water to cook the rice. And that asparagus can just stay there. We'll start with that. Meg was here, she'd be really unhappy. She'd be like, oh, you Gotta put these around the edge like that and I mean, oh no they're facing the wrong way. Oh gosh, yeah, she can be, she's going livid. It's gotta be Instagram worthy. Not that I'm joking, she's not like that, but but she is really. But um yeah there we go, look at that. It's beautiful, isn't it? Look at that. that looks like um it's like your eyes, Meg. Beautiful. Stargate SG-1. Put that on. So if you haven't cooked with one of these before, it does come across a bit strange that you do rice and pasta and things on them, but um, I guess it depends, you know, how much water they can hold. That holds more than enough to do rice in for, you know, probably four people. 
um, if you did the rice first and there wasn't anything around the edge so you know it's pretty cool because at the end of it you just boil off some water wipe it down let it cool put it all away or just chuck it in the awning and, and there's no washing up really to do apart from the plates of course but no pots and pans or a stove you know spitting so I'm kind of sold on the idea once I saw it I thought this is really interesting and I want to try it but I want to build my own because I don't want to spend four hundred dollars and it seems to work and I like that the um the stove underneath is my backpacking stove so I take that off I chuck it in the LK go for a hike and you know it's all the same transferable kit if you get what I mean going for a little while now it's about five minutes probably need to top up a bit of water on that it looks done though I haven't actually changed the water once on it I mean top the water up not changed it but that's just because of this stainless lid so uh, give it a try see what it's like yeah, I mean that is almost there probably don't even need to top that water up just put that back on let it cook Bit of a small plate, isn't it? Let's see if the meat's tough or not. Not at all. Really good. Mm. I like it medium. Meg likes it medium rare. <coughs> so I guess that hot plates big enough to shift something out of the way if you want different uh, I don't even know what you call it cooking things Flies are all over me. Pretty easy to clean up this hot plate. I definitely recommend this lid though. Honestly, it transforms the cooking of this, makes it so much better. I mean, it's quite a big thing, but you know, when you compare it to a stove and it's kind of the same size packed away. And then that's it, it's basically clean. So you just boil off all the all the crap. It all comes off and then you tip it away. Just shut that off. It's done. Tip it away. And dry it off now and it's done and dusted. Let's leave all that there. Air it out. Seems to be a lot of heavy footed activity around here. And uh, it's time to make some noise. I want dessert and I want it on an open fire. So I'm thinking this little pit here. Gonna have bananas and chocolate before bed. Cup of tea and then I'm gonna turn in. It's pretty late, around about 10 o'clock. Obviously still broad daylight and it will be for the rest of the night. But it sort of messes you up a little bit. Oh, sorry. There we are.
Well, that's it from me from day one. Uh, what a cracking day, really enjoyed it. Wind's really picking up and I'm kind of sketching a bit. I think it's gonna be okay, but obviously nothing's okay depending on how strong the wind is. And um, that was just Velcro on the actual window, kind of ripping away and separating a bit. And, and that's that's just because I've got it pinned down pretty tight. But um, yeah, we'll see what the weather's doing. I mean, hopefully it's going to be an okay night. I've got some earplugs, so that'll be all right. But uh, yeah, I should have thought more about the setup and maybe put the vehicle like that. But I wanted the cooking area to not be super windy, you know. I wanted to be a bit more comfortable at the back of the vehicle. But yeah, I'll see you in the morning. Hopefully this uh, this morning room will still be here. Good morning. I've survived the night. The awning's still here. Honestly, the wind picked up something ferocious last night. And uh, and it wasn't really the awning I started to then worry about. It was the um, it was the trees in front of the jeep. You know that that became a little bit of a concern just basically because uh, you know it's the edge of the forest and it's always the big trees on the edge of the forest on the soft embankments that are the first to go. But um, I'm pretty sure there's some mosquitoes in here, like one or two. But I didn't take any damage, I don't think. Um, I mean, I slept with this over my head because of the constant daylight and I, and I slept really soundly once I got to bed Like after about sort of one o'clock in the morning or something after the wind kind of started to die down um, Yeah, I was out cold the whole night and it was a really comfortable warm night. Um, I think I just woke up briefly and uh, Put this on in the morning because uh, you know the temperatures you know where your body temperature drops basically you know a little bit at a certain point in the night so uh, yeah gonna wake up now gonna make some tea obviously man there's more than one mosquito in here there's actually a fair few See how warm that is. I think I'm going to go with an open fire this morning, do some pancakes with banana and Nutella. That's the way I'm going to roll. I would love to uh, get this on the open fire, save some gas really, and get rid of these flies. Should be able to just stand this in here. Yeah, I like that. That is beautiful. It's uh, off the ground as well. I love it. So, uh, cut, cut some logs up. This is a fantastic place to camp. And, uh, you know, I'm really enjoying it here. This warm weather's a nice pick up for today, but oh my God, the flies. It's not the mosquitoes now. As I said, it's too warm, they dehydrate, but it's the knot. These tiny little sort of biting flies, you see them all over me around my face. They don't care about the mosquito repellent. You know, that they're, they're interested in just like having a piece, basically.
doesn't appear to be no fire ban at the moment, which is great. So uh, I can have a nice open fire, save some fuel. It's nice to cook on that hot plate uh, with the open fire. It's really, really nice. But oh, it's been a real peaceful experience so far being out here. I can't wait to get out hiking today. I've just been using the binoculars, getting the lay of the land and uh, you just see so much. You see so much more when you're walking as well. Like the thing about driving around the car, you've got the sound of the engine, you're moving pretty quick. And uh, you know, it's nice for getting places fast and for having a comfortable camp, having like, like a base camp, you know, if you're gonna spend, like I am a few days here, you know, you've got some comfort, but then you can go off out and, you know, do some exploring and stuff. But I'm gonna head up to the top of this, um, this cliff here. Um, I've seen like a, a trail cut through, pro probably just like a game trail or something, but you know, we're gonna, get, gonna check it out, see what's up there. Whilst I'm waiting for the fire to burn down, just gonna have a, a little gander under the old vehicle. Look for, uh, you know, to see some of the work I've done, whether it's become undone or not. Yeah, that track bar's really, really solid now. Now I replaced the home on the track bar, my death wobble really vanished and uh, it's been running great and also fixed the leak on the differential. Um, it was leaking like where the shaft went into the pumpkin basically, where, where the housing went into the pumpkin. And um, I don't really know why, I, I guess years of movement and everything else. So I had to open it up again, bit of silicon round there, welded round there basically and everything. And uh, it se seems to have, have stopped. There's actually a tiny bit of oil residue there, but it's not like absolutely dripping out everywhere, which I hate. One thing I have replaced is the front drive shaft. This one's 30 inches compressed. It's a very long shaft. And um, I think it's uh, from a 1989 uh, four litre. That's what it was, was listed as, as, as a kind of remanufactured one or rebuilt one or, or you know, an aftermarket one, not, not original of course, but seems to be doing very well. And uh, you know, I've got no movement in that slip joint when it was flipping terrible before and the vibrations were massively noticeable between taking the shaft on and off. So that's a big plus as well. But I think the good thing is I've got no oil leaks. This thing used to drip oil from the rear main seal everywhere. Now the clutch is done, the rear main seal's done and, and you know, I've really tried my hardest to stop it leaking everywhere. It's great because I flipping hate going out into the forest and it dripping oil all over the place. But um, there is a little bit here and there, but I guess, you know, there's always gonna be a tiny bit kind of leaking off this old diesel engine in some place and, and, and getting warm and running down but it doesn't look like it's coming from the rear main anyway it might be where i topped it up the other day and it's just found its way to the bottom i think the best addition was this though this just piece of plastic here i just basically screwed that into this aluminium splash guard this is just a, a sort of skid really designed to take stone impact and mud and all the damage that can occur to the floor pan. Obviously when I did the frame stiffeners, the box rockers tied those in together, you know, did loads of kind of corrosion repair and everything. I didn't really want to have to visit that again in a hurry. So putting this here has just really saved all the undercoat, all, all the kind of Dynatrol undercoat from getting damaged and pierced really by stones. And then, you know, the cycle of corrosion beginning again. But I noticed like all the mud and stones would zip up through this gap in, in the, in the, um, on the sliders and just take out the door and I was getting stain damage on the rear door like little chips and things nothing serious but you know it was it was kind of like the warning sign so just putting this piece of plastic here which you know you can um obviously push down a bit if you want to but it's just saved like the doors from getting thrashed basically from stones and because it's angled like that the water goes like that and then it just runs down goes onto this and comes out the drain holes at the back and it all seems to be working Pretty damn well. All right, looks good. Gonna have to work fast. Maybe I'll elevate it up a bit. Oh, look at that. Love it, butter's melting already. Forgot the oil, but don't really like using oil too much. Let that get nice and hot. American style, nice and chunky. Bit on my plate as well. Try and 
try another. Maybe go a bit bigger this time. This Merica isn't flat, so everything tends to congregate to the middle, which can be a bit tricky with the old pancos, but this is just me creating excuses really because I'm sort of thinking I'm going to fuck this up and everyone's going to be like, Mike, you're a disgrace. And, um, you know, story of my life, really. Water's looking super calm though, right? Perfect for fly fishing, but by the time I get done with this and I start doing that, imagine if Gale Force, it's like a level five cyclone's gonna come in like last night. <laughs> I was really worried about these trees. I mean, they've, they've not really got much uh, foliage on them to be able to act as a sail so much, but you look at the root structures and it's a different story, really. It's flipping high, isn't it? Maybe like that. Well, they look... um. Well, they look a lot better. They, they, I'm sure they're going to taste a lot better than they look. Not a meal I'd have every day, but uh, nice to have when you're out camping. But I mean, you know, a lot of butter and a, a lot of fat and stuff. You'd be a tank if you ate this every morning. Let's try it. See if they're any good. Mm. Nice. It's actually a waffle mix. Not a pancake mix, but it does the job. Look at the flies, they're loving it. They're just loving it, they're all over me, but um, the best thing you can do is just just, just not actually give a shit. <laughs> but I've uh, got some interesting mushrooms on the way up. I've got some morels, some common morels, growing around here. So a uh, good edible mushroom that. Time of year where you find it, that one's a bit munched and a bit far gone, but I shall keep my eyes peeled, I'm just on my way up. So I'm off the beaten track. It's pretty uh, far away from camp now. And uh, I've just gotten to the cliff that I would like to try and traverse. There's no trail, so it's a bit of bushwhacking. Which isn't too bad, but it's just, it's just watching your step. I think if you're going to come and do this, then... Uh, you know, you've just got to be mindful that, you know, it's it's not like a park. It is like a wilderness area. And, you know, I mean, although bears are sighted a lot, I've seen a bear myself and my friend saw some the other day. It's, uh, it's more about like, not so much the worry of a bear, it's more like if you're you know, on a bike and you, you're making much noise and then you like get between a, a youngster and its mother or you're a hunter and you shoot a bear and you piss it off but more to the point, it's just more about sure footing um, and making sure that you know, you've got sure footing because there can be a lot of rocks and things you've got to be careful about but um, before I come to places like this, I always give the coordinates to Meg. I always tell her when I'm going to be back. And, um, you know, always make sure that I try to, uh, you know, take care of myself. Because if you look at that, you know, there's the danger. You know, that this, kind, this is the kind of issue you run into. So, based upon that, I'm going to go down and I'm going to go that way 
where it's not so steep and it sort of curves around and it's it's a bit more of a a better entry to the top well here we are at the top nice nice little track bit sketchy actually in some parts but anyway i hope you've enjoyed it thanks for watching and i'll see you in another video take care Well, I've been on the asphalt for about half an hour and as per usual asphalt turns to gravel roads and in this case gravel roads have turned into terrain tracks and I'm right at the beginning of a 35 kilometre track that's going to take me to hopefully a pretty nice camp location by a lake but as you can see around me there's been a huge amount of rain over the last couple of weeks a lot of rivers are swollen and a lot of these streams are kind of filling up so I'm hoping this track doesn't get too swampy up ahead because I can see on the map that it goes into quite a a little bit of a swampy area and I hope I don't get stuck but I got the winch and all the other gear with me so hopefully I should be okay but I'm going to be out for a couple of days I thought I'd take you along with me and first things first sway bar off and tire pressure down nice bit of bulge everyone loves a nice bulge Always a ton of rubbish everywhere you go. So far track's been all right, not been too bad, just been trundling along, no flooding, nothing too technical, no down trees. I mean, you never know when you come to places like this what you can find. Sometimes you find a huge tree down, sometimes a big washout, but yeah, so far it's been pretty nice. But it's obviously just slow going because it's so bumpy that you just can't like gun it down the track and, uh, you know, make some progress. But it looks like we're coming up to something here that looks a little bit boggy. wasn't really anything to write home about. I was starting to think we were descending into the bogs of the eternal abyss but uh, yeah it was nothing really. Just a, just a little wet patch. I think we're going uphill basically and everything's kind of running down now so I expect it'll dry out quite a bit but uh, ah here we go. This looks a little bit wetter. Okay. It's really flooded. I'm just gonna dip my toe in. Well, it's getting squidgy. So it just depends whether what's under the squidgy is hard, but uh, I might just get my recovery gear ready just in case, but there's absolutely nothing to winch off of. Still ain't got no struts yet. But I made these panniers that can hang down like that so uh, I can have my recovery gear accessed pretty easily and not have to lock it because of the kind of locks I've got but uh, probably gonna need these straps maybe hopefully not and this stuff here I'll chuck it down there and the blanket and that should be it
left by the way, not from the driving, but obviously I had to set the camera up so I was running back and forth doing that kind of stuff. Hence why I'm soaked. Well that looks like most of that all done and, and now it's back to gravel roads which is cool. So we're going to make some distance on the gravel roads and I think about another 20 kilometres and we'll be there. Beautiful place. Probably could have relocked the sway bar just to get a bit of extra height there up the front instead of the axle articulating. Or maybe put some air back in the tyre, but to be honest, it looks pretty level to me. Well, just going to pull the plug on the old mattress, so the X-Bed Mega Mat inflates. Nice to see all this bedding, it's really dry. It's been stored in here for um, quite a long time, actually weeks. Uh, not that it's been outside, it's been in a garage, but I've still been out driving in the rain, you know, washed the vehicle, all that sort of stuff. So, um, you know, the tent clearly, uh, clearly keeps the water out, which is important. So I'm going to open up some vents anyway. So let some air circulate through. Got a little auxiliary line in here for the diesel heater. It's predominantly for the diesel heater, but I've kind of put the same plug and all the other external appliances too, like the pump for the mattress, you know, just because it makes sense to be able to use the same line. I'm just blowing up a mattress, not anything else, all right? Not tonight anyway. Feels good. Oh dang, it's gonna be a comfy night. <laughs>
I was going to have the awning room set up tonight, but I think I'm just going to be outside a little bit nicer. Can't really be bothered to set it up. I'm only going to probably stay here for one night, and I think I'm going to find another location because, um, you know, maybe somewhere a bit higher altitude, bit of a view. But I've got these bags from uh, Grab My Gear from Jim in Australia. They're really nice, actually. And this is what me and Meg keep our clothes in. Spare pair of trousers, obviously, because I had a feeling it was going to be wet. But I was carrying a little bag inside to put the dirty stuff in, and I just rotate it as I go. And then when this fills up, it's time to wash it on a summer trip. This time of year, it's a little bit difficult to do that. But I'll take a few things up in the awning room with me. The hat I'm keeping down here. Some bed socks. And... Uh, some clothes for tomorrow morning, like a shirt, some sexy underwear, look at that, no skiddies on that one, must have been a good day, and uh, yeah, a pair of socks, usually keep that up there, I put it in the sleeping bag when I'm sleeping, so I sleep with my clothes, not in a sexy way, um, but it just means that they don't kind of get condensation on them um, from, from my body basically, because they're in the bag with me. I'm going to be testing out my diesel heater tonight. As you saw in the build episode, you may not have seen it, but I did a build episode on this and now it's taking fuel from the, the main tank of the Jeep, being it's a diesel vehicle. So this is where I'm going to have it tonight. Um, it's probably going to be about zero degrees tonight, so it's not really cold. I don't need the diesel heater. My gear is well capable of dealing with zero degrees, but I'm just keen to try it out before the winter kicks in. I just want to see what it's like up there. I'm going to run it real low. Um, it's going to use absolutely bugger all fuel. But I'm going to have this as the intake. I'm just going to go around there. Um, so it's well away from the exhaust. And uh, this is going to go up into the rooftop tent there. And I've obviously got the exhaust here, like an extension line. So the idea is I can basically move the exhaust kind of anywhere I want, really. You know, something like that. Have that on the end of there. Have it facing down, but it does, you know, it doesn't smell great, so I'll fire it up later when it actually gets cold. This is the kind of stuff I'm always looking for to make my life easy around a camp with with regards to fire, especially in a country like this where um, you've got predominantly uh, a lot of spruce and pine and birch and you, know, you don't really have oak and ash and beech and uh, other other sort of hardwoods here, the broadleaf. So I look for the roots and basically pile up a huge pile of roots because they're packed full of resin, they're real dense, they burn forever. If you find a good one, It'll do the whole night one fire, but crap for cooking on. You never really need to just like run a knife down a tree, a birch tree, and take the bark. I see it everywhere. You can always find a tree that's dead on the ground, or like this one here, it's just naturally shedding. And you get loads of this resin rich bark. You're not harming the tree. I know, I'm using a lighter. Be a lot of people who are disappointed in me who are from my other channel. But, you know, I did drive here in a car, so can't really get out the primitive skills when you're uh, you're rolling around in that. But anyway, well, the fire's roaring nicely. Um, certainly not a very good cooking fire, though. Great for boiling water, but those roots don't stop producing flames for hours and hours and hours given all the resin inside them but I really wanted a fire just to make me feel a little bit, a bit more homely kind of felt a little bit dingy around here but I'm going to be trying out this white gas system tonight on the old um, Muruka so uh, I'm going to be cooking up some salmon that my lovely wife gave me just before I left yeah. Yeah, there we go. I think I'm going to get undercover it's absolutely spunking it down Sort of like 
like you know it's what most chefs wish they could they could uh, be this quick really but it takes time it takes practice you know it takes practice Father weather is coming in. I think we're in for a rainy, windy night. Yeah. Cooking on these things gets, uh, you know, you've got to get used to it, but it's pretty simple really. I'm just moving the rice out now. It's basically cooked. Um, and then I'm just going to burn off a lot of this water. We'll cook off a lot of the water and then, then a bit of oil, courgettes, do them, move them out then the fish and then lid on let it all warm up let it all kind of like the juices and stuff like get going in it and, uh, and then it's ready to go it's a bit of a longer process but it's one one plate you know it doesn't really need cleaning or anything it's just really easy to be honest for me Well, it's the end of the day, dinner's done. I've squared away camp, last cup of tea. I mean, it's still early doors, really, it's six o'clock. Oh, it's actually about seven now. So, you know, it's, it's getting dark this time of year. It's not like where you see me out in the summer where everything's really bright and it's just constant daylight and you're just like, yeah, whatever, I'm gonna fish till like three in the morning and you know, your, your, your clock, your body clock goes out the window. But um, I thought while I was sitting here, and just drinking this tea, I just touch on a question I get asked quite a bit on the other channel and, and on this one, normally through private messages on various platforms and stuff. And it's just about kind of like, how do you combat the fear of being out, you know, in, in the wilderness, in nature, wherever, um, and, and the fear of the dark and being alone. And I, and I guess really it's kind of, kind of around loneliness. If there were 10 other people here, you know and the average person would feel completely secure but when you're on your own your your senses are going to be heightened i think that's pretty normal i mean most animals kind of burrow away at night and uh you know the predators come out to play with their nocturnal vision and they, uh, you know and, and acute hearing and eyesight so you know it, it's pretty normal i think for most people to feel kind of a bit more kind of like on edge at night because you know your vision is impaired and your vision is predominantly you know how you how you detect oncoming danger one of one of the ways so essentially hearing and, and your eyes widen because you know you you can't see so you rely on other senses more than your vision which is going to sketch you out a bit i think it's pretty normal really i mean i'm not obviously i'm a little bit more kind of uh, than, than when it's broad daylight sitting in this spot right here and you know and i do things around camp to make me feel more comfortable like I put a fire on you know I didn't do that because I wanted to cook on it you know maybe I'll do bananas and chocolate on it in a bit but you know it's predominantly just to make me feel kind of more you know at home really at camp you know to, just to make me feel more at home but um you know in terms of to answering that question how do you kind of combat the fear of being alone I think it completely depends on what country you live in um you know are you surrounded by people are there a lot you know a lot of people around are you in a woodland and, and there's like a housing estate nearby or, or are you in the middle of australia you know on some outback trip and 
there's nothing around you in Africa you're in northern Ontario you where I am now in the north of Sweden you know I mean it just depends you know here where I am you've got bears you've got I guess you know there are wolves but they're pretty rare um, you know you've got other sort of predatory animals I guess you've got elk which aren't really a predator but you know they can be a they can be a problem anyway if you startle them to, you know so you know you have I've got things like that but that that to me has never really been a concern isn't you know especially here in, in Sweden you know I've seen videos of curious bears in the spring like charging up on people um, normally people with dogs and stuff to be honest with you um, you know yeah the young bears you know they don't quite know everything yet yeah sure I mean this year has been a very bad berry season you might attribute that to some things that could happen potentially but most of the time human beings are pretty scary and animals want to stay away from them you know and when you make a fire and you make a lot of noise like I am and disturbances and stuff animals instincts are really to stay away from conflict unless it's the last resort you know so um i don't really worry about animals so much where i am i mean if you're in the north of canada and stuff i guess you know in alaska you've got grizzlies and things and, and it's a little bit different their mentality is a bit different than it is here despite them being the same species i think on paper but uh you know for me the main concern really is human beings this tends to be why when I go out on these little excursions, whether on foot or in vehicle or in vehicle and then on foot, you know, I tend to go as far away from people as possible. But, but you know, for example, back in the UK, I camped on the West Welsh coastline for a long time and I hunted in the hammock camped there. There was like a murderer not far from my camp that I always camped at who just killed someone in, in the town up the coast. So... You know, he had little encampment there, and I'm pretty sure I stumbled across that. It wasn't too far from the old fishing house that was that was down on that property. And, um, you know, I was kind of skulking around there with my gun, shooting pigeons and stuff at the time. You know, and that could have been a great opportunity for somebody like that to get a firearm and, and kind of snuff me out and get my equipment. So, you know, I'm amazed I even slept there, really, but I didn't know. I was none the wiser. Um, so... You know that that's that's just kind of like a reminder that nature's not like um, you know, like a fluffy pillow where everything's going to go okay. Yeah, in the human world, when something goes wrong, we're all in uproar because you know it's a controlled environment. Well, it's meant to be anyway, but out here it isn't a controlled environment. You know, you're coming out here and you're packing equipment and gear and everything else because you want to be prepared to a degree um, in in this environment for most eventualities. So. You know, that, that's kind of the reality of the situation. I mean, there is no safety net out here. You're the safety net and your intuition of where you camp and everything else and your research and your re recon into the environment, looking at maps of their houses nearby. You know, have hunters been here? Am I going to disturb hunters? Am I going to go walking through the bush? you know with an elk suit on when there are hunters out hun hun hunting elk of course you're not you know you, you can put yourself in dangerous situations i guess but for me i think primary is human beings are the most unpredictable of of that equation really you know me seeing some bear, bear shit over there that might not be that old doesn't really worry me that much um but you know if there was like music going on over there and a load of young kids setting fire to stuff yeah of course I'm going to be a bit sketched out and I'm going to move camp so it's kind of as simple as that really but you know there are things you can do obviously to make yourself feel more comfortable just be prepared do your research have good equipment you know keep your wits about you you know just just and get out there and do it because if you don't you'll regret it and life will fly by and you'll be like oh I never did that and I wanted to and fear is a good motivator for people. You know, fear is a good reminder that, that you know, that not only you're alive, but um, you can overcome it and it will only ever empower you when you overcome fear and you get out of those situations. So the world, it could be a lot worse. You know, solo camping is, yeah, it's, it's very relaxing for me anyway. But yeah, there we go. That's just my two cents on it.
Well, let's see what happens. When it fires up, it does uh, makes a pretty quite a bit of racket, really. So we're gonna have to see how this goes. You know, one thing to bear in mind, and you've got to be really, you really should have a carbon monoxide detector with these things. Mine hasn't arrived yet. I did order one online, um, a new one. Um, but it's just making sure that the intake is drawing in fresh air all the time and not the exhaust and also not the smoke from the fire. I'm going to have to make sure that fire's out, so I'm going to put it out with some water later when I'm done with it. Because obviously the smoke might drift over here and it's going to be sucking in the smoke and blowing it in the tent and then you're dying of inhalation. So you do have to be, you know, thinking about this sort of stuff. But yeah, it's like a flipping aeroplane. <laughs> When it's, when it's warming up. Well, I'm up in the roof tent, all tucked up in bed, and uh, yeah, gonna, gonna hit the sack early. I mean, it's pretty dark out there, so there's, there's not too much you can do. Fire's out, got the, uh, the duct coming in through the, through the wall there, a bit of ventilation, obviously here and there. It's, you know, it's t-shirt weather in here really, but not, overly warm. So um, the diesel heat is on its lowest setting, about 1.5 hertz, so it's just kind of trundling in a bit of warmth. And uh, yeah, we'll see how it goes. I mean, it's pretty good so far. I think if I've got it on its lowest setting now and it's like zero degrees outside, then, you know, when it's minus 20, you know, I think it's gonna be able to heat this place up very, very easily. It's quite a small space and it's got this reflective material all over it, this particular roof tent, so, I'm generally pretty hot in here most of the time, so uh, yeah, see you in the morning. Hopefully. Well, it's the morning and uh, it was a pretty sound night, although my sinuses still haven't cleared up. You know, I've got to uh, have this for, for weeks now, so when I wake up in the morning, I'm like, ugh. Can't, can't think properly, can't see properly, but um, you can kind of see that things are dry, drier than a popcorn fart in here, which was once a famous quote quoted to me by someone. Really dry, the bed's dry, under the bed's dry. I just checked everything really to see what the condensation's like. If you've got a foam mat, you'll probably find that underneath that foam mat, there'll be condensation, but in my case, um, I've got one of those like condensation mats, then the X-bed blow up mat. So everything's basically super dry in here. I do have ventilation still. This is open, the door's open a bit. A vent over here and a vent over here. So despite the diesel heater going, I still want air to sort of be able to get out and get in, um, you know, pretty easily. Let's have a look. I bet you it's gonna be a damp day. Yeah. Just checking on the eco flow and it's, it's doing pretty good. That's with the fridge and the diesel heater, but obviously when the fridge kicks in every now and then it draws a bit of power, then it shuts off like it is at the moment. Um, so, that's uh, that's pretty good. The, the diesel heater doesn't really draw much power at all. doing in there. Despite the heavy rain, this fire shall live to burn another day. So what that meant, that was really old English for um, 
the fire is probably still alive under there despite the rain and that I must make a blanket to warm him back to life. Let us have a, have a gander. Ah yes. The spider. better. Mm. You may ask why such a big fire. Well they start big and then they go very small. You know then they're good for cooking on so when that all burns down to ember I shall get the, mar the maruca on there, take the stove off first of course and I shall do my pancakes and my breakfast on there. Bit of a rush last night, not much daylight, a lot of filming. That track was much longer than I thought it would be, it took a bit of time. So, uh, yeah, take it easy today. Before this rain gets really bad, I think uh, I'm going to put this tent away because I don't intend to stay here for another night. I fabbed this up a little while ago on this plate because the idea always was that I wanted to be able to cook on an open fire, but now it's flipping stuck, isn't it? As soon as it's on camera, it all goes wrong. Oh, can't not come out. Oh, there you go, yeah. So this is just a windshield thing. And then the stove just come, comes out like that. And you can sort of pack it away and go camping if you want with it. But yeah, the idea is now I can cook on an open fire. Leave that there for a while, it's gonna get flipping hot. That's looking damn fine. Hell yeah.
Well, it's probably about time I did some talking. If you've watched my videos for a, for a while, you'll know that I can't stay quiet for long. But uh, when I come out and camp on my own, I don't obviously talk to anyone. And you know, I just enjoy the sights and sounds of nature. But I thought I'd say hello and welcome you back to the channel or welcome you if you're new to the channel. This is a location I've wanted to come to for quite some time. It's pretty high up and as you can hear, it's pretty windy. And I think it's gonna be quite a windy night, but I've got the setup positioned so that the shell takes the brunt of the wind and hopefully it should be a pretty quiet night. But I'm gonna dip my rod in the water now, see what comes out. No, not that rod.
getting a bit peckish and I thought I'd cook over an open fire tonight. I had the fire in front of the Jeep, not behind it. Mainly for a number of reasons really. The ground out there is just really nice and it's a pristine area. Um, just having it on the gravel track here and when it all burns to ashes it's all going to blow away and you, you won't even know I was here if that makes sense. It'll just wash away. Yeah and also safety really. The wind's all over the shop and if this thing gets too big and too gnarly it's just in direct line with the Jeep so uh, that's not so good but shame I didn't catch uh, anything for dinner. Yeah I was expecting at least some perch or pike to come out but you know, maybe I'm just shit and I didn't catch anything so you know that's a shame but I've got a steak, I've got some nice vegetables, a bit of potato, I'm gonna get the hot plate on here, the scottle, the murica they call it here in Sweden, cook some stuff up, have a bit of food, get ready for a cold night. Chef level speed there. Nice meal to end the day. 
and the sun is setting. Getting earlier and earlier every week by about 20 minutes until it's just going to be pitch black for a while until spring comes. So just enjoying it while it lasts really. Lush place, nice food, chilled day. Can't really ask for more than that. Or you could, but... This location is, is really beautiful. I had a great night last night. I looked out my window of the roof tent. I could see the moon reflecting on the lake. The wind had died down. It, it, was, a, it was a really nice night. No northern lights, sadly. Me and a friend of mine actually were out, I think it were about four weeks ago, and we had a hell of a display. It was a really nice night. It was a great camp. But I had the diesel heater going um, before I went to bed last night, just to kind of take the the dew off of the sheets so to speak you know it can get a bit of damp up there as the evening sets in at this time of year so it just really dries it out up there and then while you're reading it's nice and warm um, and I turn it off before I go to bed because I hate the sound of it it's much nicer to hear the sound of the wind 
cutting through the trees and the leaves and the grass blowing um, than, than it is a drone of a diesel heater. But it is going to be useful when it's like minus 20, minus 15, I think. It's going to have to be on the whole night, which is a big plus really for the fire alarm and the carbon monoxide detector. So, um, you know, you really need stuff like that when you're running those kind of things. They're pretty reliable, but you never know. It's mainly the exhaust that can cause problems. But before I came out on this um, little excursion, I had a degree of apprehension. I delayed my departure. I made excuses, I made enough, another cup of tea and then made something to eat. And I was delaying and delaying. And, uh, and I do that with every trip I go on, whether it's a day, which I wouldn't really call a trip, I'd just call that an outing. But whether it's two weeks or a week, I always find myself delaying my departure. And I guess it's because that comfortable part of my brain is trying to get me to stay in my comfort zone and not go out into the big wide world. And I saw a quote before I came out and it said, the big wide world, this is, this is roughly what it said anyway, the big wide world is a scary place and you might lose your body out here, but if you stay at home, you'll lose your soul. And when I read that, I instantly just poured my tea down the sink and I walked out the door and drove away because it's so true you know it is so true anyway I've spat out enough nonsense <laughs> it's time to make some breakfast and yes I'm having pancakes again leave me alone in the comment, comment section you, know, you say what you want I like pancakes alright when I'm out camping I don't care what they look like Well, I'm back out in the wilderness again, and I'm in a really beautiful location. It took me about half an hour to get here, mostly just driving on the back roads, slowly going up in elevation, but not too high, but high enough to see a little bit of frost creeping about, and it was about minus six last night, and now it's kind of warming up to like plus three or four degrees C. So it's real misty, but it does make for a pretty beautiful sight. The Jeep's all decked out, and I've put it back on the winter tyre, so it's on the bead locks with the studded Cooper tyres on it, as the roads are a little bit treacherous this morning. I got out pretty early, but I'm not going to be staying here. I just wanted to check this location out because I spotted it on the map and I thought, well, maybe it is going to be a nice spot. And it is pretty nice. But um, the other location I've got in mind is about 50 kilometers away. It's going to be a bit of a drive, mostly the back roads of how I've planned it. Anyway, I should stop talking. Let's get going. Let's not pretend we don't know who's up there. It's a real treacherous time of year this because you have this layer of ice on top and the ground feels really hard when you walk on it. And then you drive in and it breaks and, and all the mush and the runoff underneath that hasn't frozen yet just kind of starts to get churned up. But I only just came down here really to have a cup of tea and take a leak basically, and have a little break. But um, yeah, we'll see how it goes.
little bit of memory foam. Ooh, this is a pretty decent bag. I use this for backpacking. It's a Thermarest uh, down bag. It's going to be pretty cold tonight, but this one can go down to about minus 18. So uh, that is extremely um, cold compared to what it's going to be tonight. I think it's about minus 7 tonight. So, but you know, good to be prepared anyway. I can't imagine I'll sleep with the diesel heater running. The noise is... Uh, been out with it a few times now with it running and the noise is horrible but I, I like using it in the evening when I'm reading and in the morning when I've just woken up and I just want to chill in the tent for a bit you know and have it a bit warm. The sun's on its way down and it's uh, starting to cool off. Before it cools off too much when I start losing a bit too much body heat I'm gonna get me old uh, jacket on and then put that over the top of it and um, I'm tempted to have a little fire tonight, but uh, yeah, we'll see how that goes. Hundred percent battery. Cold in there as well. But we don't need that on anymore. It's warmer in the fridge than it is out here. Hmm. I think I shall take a few things out. I'll just leave the leave the lid open for a while. Just let it cool off in the fridge. Bit of a treat for later. Winter chanterelles. Ooh. Hell yeah. As temps drop, I have to take this off and either put it in the vehicle or up in the awning room. And I'm still missing a lid for the one the other side. So uh, I just carry that because it looks good. Without a lid. Got some new tea. Went back to the UK recently and picked up a box of Yorkshire Gold. Jesus Christ. It's the most powerful tea this side of Europe. Gave some to some friends and they, they can't get enough of that now. They just, I got them, I got them in the palm of my hand. With the Murica here, normally I'm cooking on white gas these days and uh, you know, prime is power fuel basically. Uh, it's much cheaper than these bottles and working in really, really low temps like minus 40, it doesn't really matter. So um, unfortunately I've run out, so I'm back on the bottles again. You can see how much longer they really take, but the Primus winterized version of this kind of power gas you get here, although this is MSR, in Sweden, you, it's pr pretty much dominated by Primus. Um, it's, it's about 15 euros for a tin of the winterized version of that. So that's why it's way better to get the power fuel. It's like one liter is about nine euros and it lasts, you know, much longer really. You're getting more fuel for your money, but you just have to pump it basically to make it all work, which some people don't like, but yeah, it's expensive when you camp a lot. Legendary. Thought I'd come and say goodbye to the sun. Don't get much sunlight this time of year and we're not even in the dead of winter yet. So um, the days are, are pretty decent at the moment. You, you're getting sort of fairly strong sunlight from around 10 o'clock till, yeah, around about 2.30. So we're coming up to three o'clock now and the sun is, uh, is making a beeline for the trees, so gonna be gone pretty soon you know I'd say 
say 20 minutes, 15 minutes, and it's down behind the trees and gone. Chanterelles up here, but uh, looks like lots of them are being munched by something, or someone's up here picking them. Pretty much all gone. talking about. I'm going to have myself a fire. I feel a little bit bad making one up here because I'm not really going to be here as I say but you know I'm sure logging machines will do worst but um, getting all the materials together just made some small feathers, cut some dead standing, split that down, get the dry wood in the middle, make lots of kindling, found a root and uh, that's full of resin, fat wood. Great stuff this. There's not really any birch in this forest if you break that open you basically see all, all you've got resin and um, you can break that down and use that for another day so we can scrape that with the back of a knife put a spark in it get that lit get the feather lit then get the kindling lit and then we've got ourselves a, a fire So cold. There we are. Try and move that in nice and quick. It's a little bit of a terrible fire lay, really, and a, and a pathetic attempt. So, in 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 order not to smother it, I have to hold the stack a little bit, just to allow the fuel, like the tinder, like the the, the fat wood and stuff, to burn. Um, if that goes down too soon, then then you'll lose it, really. But it can be rescued really. Once the fuel wood's going, like the kindling and stuff, it should be it should be all good. But you can even see it's still struggling. You really gotta make sure that wood's lit when you've done a fire like me. But we all do them, right? Time to time you just don't put as much effort in as you did on a really warm sunny day with perfect materials all around you. Ooh. 
Nice. Going to keep it simple tonight. Just going to build the fire up big and strong and um, get a fairly nice bed of embers. Going to detach this, take the uh, stove off and cook on an open fire. I like to do that sometimes. I know, like, you know, you drive around with all this equipment, but uh, it's good to keep your hand in it, I think. And then if you're in an area like this, it's pretty deep in the wilderness. It feels quite remote and um, you know, you're a little bit sort of, you know, we want to make it feel a little bit more homely. A fire's a good shape really, but I've got to let it burn down before I put this on. It's going to be impossible to cook on it for at least, well, at least sort of half an hour, 45 minutes. So I'm going to have to make some more tea, sadly. Tonight I've got some nice food planned really, going to keep it a bit foresty. Got a piece of steak, got some yellow foot and um, yeah, going to have a bit of potato I think. And yeah, tomato, something like that. Just cook it all up on the murica. And yeah, should be lush actually. I know I have two little outlets there. One's normally for the awning room, but I haven't got anything to block it off. So I just put both of them up in the roof tent and I'm going to have it recirculating the air tonight, see what the cond condensation's like, but just try and keep the power usage at a minimum. Camping in the winter is, is very different to camping in the summer. You know, if it was the summer, I mean, it'd be daylight now, it'd be daylight all night. It'd be warm-ish, you know, it depends really. And you kind of get that false sense of security with daylight, don't you? You know, you're, it's like camping in the day all the time. No, nobody feels sketched out when they're doing that. But, you know, when you come out here and it's really, really dark and it's really remote, you hear all these stories, people go missing. Um, you know, people see weird in the forest and freaks them out and then they never go out there again. There's some weird stuff in the world that we don't know about and that makes you a little bit more paranoid, doesn't it? About people and, and things and, uh, you know, you hear a little noise when you turn your head and it, it's just your hat catching your jacket. You catch a glimpse of something moving in the shadows like I'm doing now, there's something up there It keeps moving around like in the darkness and, I, and, I, and I'm sort of having difficulty working out what it is um, you know and, and it just sort of throws you off basically it just it all messes you up but you know there's a lot of things going on like a raindrop goes past your eyes and it just you just catch it on the edge you know an ember from the fire sparks a little light somewhere over there and you know it, it all it all messes with you, you know, if, if you if you let it, basically. So the best thing to do when you come out, if you've not solo camped much in, in you know in the wilderness and it's dark, is try and relax. Is try and relax as much as you can. Um, or else what will happen is is your nervous system it will basically screw you over, you know, and 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 you're suddenly just be like this all the time like you'll see something there and then you'll see something there and then you'll be seeing stuff everywhere and it just you're just you're basically overloading your sphere it's overloading your system you know you've, you've got to and, and at the end of the day you know if something does go wrong sometimes a good, a good thing to do is just accept your fate even though you know potentially nothing can happen but one thing I do to calm myself down is, is just kind of, it's just embrace the the fear, embrace the unknown, just, you know, just, just let it consume you and just think, you know what, if there is nothing I can do, there's nothing I can do and whatever, you know, 
and then suddenly you sort of like almost feel empowered by that and, and it allows you to kind of just accept the situation you're in and, and just kind of care less about the outcome of your own existence if that makes sense it's an interesting thing really but um yeah anyway i'm not sure what you know why i talked about all that i guess you know i'm out here in the dark all on my own miles and miles from anywhere and uh yeah hang on Hello? Show yourself. I think I'm going to uh, get the potatoes on the go with some warm water. Get that water heating up. I have to level that. That is not good, is it? to me. I still haven't got any lights for the Jeep. Really need to sort that out. Something just above me here on the hatch would be amazing. But uh, the snow's starting to come in. There's barely snow at the moment, but Apparently we've got a yellow warning and tomorrow it's going to come down hard all day. That should be cool. Took the light that came with the rooftop tent out. Thought maybe I could use that. That's pretty nice, isn't it? It's all like flipping Christmassy, and this is yeah, cool. Mate of mine really got me into this stuff. Now I just use loads of it. Black pepper. So good. Use a bit of this as well. That was a bit too much, wasn't it? Do that. Well, there it is, grubs up, looking good. Nice steak, got some tomatoes. Done quite a lot of food, actually. Really, this is enough for two, but I will try and smash all of it. Potatoes, fried them a bit. They come out pretty nice, actually. And the chanterelles, which is definitely a good treat. That's it, nice, nice. That's it, looking good. Let's give it a try. Let's try Chanterelle first. Yeah, not bad. Mm, good flavour though. Really good flavour. The only thing is, is I have a very small plate. So that was a pretty big meal, um, but uh, yeah, I ate all of that and uh, that should do me through the night really, keep me warm. 
but it's pretty warm in here. I've got a thermometer just over here. It's 11 degrees in the roof tent and it's minus four outside. So that's a pretty big difference. And the diesel heat is running on about 3.2 Hertz. So just under half power. But while I'm up here, I thought I'd give you a little tour of what it's like. This is a Constellation Lux Double sleeping bag, um, like an all season bag, but it's nowhere kitted out for minus conditions. I think zero degrees is about the max it can handle, but it lives in here all the time. And I've got my Arctic bag in the corner, which I'll get out later on when the diesel heater gets shut off, because I won't be sleeping with it on, because it is kind of loud and it, is, it gets a bit too warm, to be honest with you. I like the sound of the trees and the wind a bit more. But I hang all my stuff up in the corner there, so my boots and everything gets hung from the top of there. Hopefully that hook will survive. If not, I'm probably sure I'll find out, you know, somewhere along the lines. But I've got the three hoses coming in, so the main one, which is the shortest hose, blows the most air. This is the one which is the intake, so I just usually tuck that down there. And this long hose goes in the bottom of the sleeping bag and just kind of inflates the sleeping bag like a, like a bit of a balloon and fills it full of warm air. So while you're inside the bag, um, it's pretty damn comfortable. But then this being a much longer hose, it means less air actually comes out of it, you know, so it's a little bit more kind of um, kind on the feet. But I don't think I'd sleep too soundly without this. This is a carbon monoxide detector. Definitely want that. Um, I usually just leave it there. I also have a fire alarm built into the diesel heater box, uh, which does work, I've tested it. So it's normally the exhaust that's a problem with these things, not so much the heater unit itself. The exhaust can, you know, things can go wrong basically and you, you just never know. I've built it as best I can, but you never know. So I have that in there just so I can hear something if it catches on fire. And it has two quick release pins on it so I can launch it off the back of the tyre carrier if need be and get it away from the vehicle so all of that really is to some people excessive to me it means i sleep better if i've got it running so um i'm going to do some reading uh i've got thomas the tank engine volume two finished volume one that was yeah it was a hell of a read really some great writing but you know i'm interested to see what volume two is going to be like and unless anything really magical or terrifying happens i'll see you in the morning Oh, snow. Wow. It's begun. I was expecting that to say way less, but 69%. That's uh, that's quite impressive, actually. I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. We're not quite deep enough into winter yet where I don't need to rely on the rotor pack for water when the snow's obviously deep. And you have ice and stuff you can just kind of not rely on it so much at all really or just have one bottle in the car if need be but this thing's kind of frozen up around here around the spigot so it's got to be taken off and i'm gonna put it in the roof tent jesus there we go warm it up
really want to get myself another litre of this uh, power gas. The white, the white gas. Because this stuff just does not cut it at this time of year, really. Well, it's not, it's all right today. It's about minus four now. But you have to kind of turn the can. For breakfast today, we're serving tomatoes and eggs, winter chanterelles, wheatboner e tomato sauce. I've given up the fight on putting the tent away in a fashion that means it doesn't have to be opened again. I think the system will work with the diesel heater and drying it all out and everything and the material being, being dry if it's not snowing. But when it's snowing, obviously, then it's worst case scenario because it's all melting and turning into ice, which it has done. Um, but one thing you've got to remember, I think, if you're in a cold climate, is to use this silicon seal treatment on the entirety of the rooftop tent, like you do on the door jams. I have to do it every year so they don't stick because if I put that away now and then I drive off somewhere and, and it heats up and then it gets cold again, it's gonna rip the seals to bits when it opens up. So this is just something you buy from the, the gas station, the fuel station, it's just a silicon rubber treatment. It'll stop it gripping and you might have to do that a couple of times, three times at absolute most over winter, um, but, uh, yeah, anyway. On this side, I put it on my hand and just do that. You know, well, 
I don't know what you guys are on about. I never cook too much. I never cook too much. I mean, this is... Well, for me, this is a portion for two. So, yeah, I did cook too much, but... <clears throat> Mother Nature's carbon-based yummy foods. This is going to be the way it's going to be. There's so little power coming out of this um this bottle. Yeah. Well, that's me basically packed away really. One thing I'd like you to note about this video is I didn't make pancakes for breakfast, did I? So, <laughs> never know, this channel's full of surprises basically. But um, I think to note the equipment, if you look at it, it's just everything's covered in snow. And when I drive along, the vehicle gets warm, that snow turns to water and it's gonna all go down into the vehicle and end up in the footwells and stuff. And that isn't really a good thing because of rust you know even though i've spent a myriad of years building the car and making it as rustless as possible and resistant water always finds a way you're never going to stop it there'll be a nook or cranny somewhere water gets in a seam you know so i kind of want to avoid that because obviously you know i want to be coming out a lot and i'm going to need to dry the vehicle out so when I get back, at some point when I've got some time, I'm going to make a tarp. I've got three camping poles, big ones at home, extendable aluminium ones, so there's no reason why I can't have a tarp coming off a hook on the back of the roof tent and expanding out over here. Or maybe just going to a couple of trees, for example, but if there's no trees, I'll use the poles. And then I can angle one side down and stop all the snow, when it does snow, from going into the vehicle. So that, that's another mod. That I'm going to do in the summer that would be terrible because then you're basically creating a safe haven for the flies to escape the sun and you'd just be hounded by mosquitoes and biting midges and horse flies and you know all the other stuff you've got here like knot and all of that horrible stuff
onto the road. Looks like we're going to need four-wheel drive. There is a fair amount of snow, but really not that much. So I'm in another location here. Um, I've been driving for a little while, not too far. Still, to be honest, in that big expanse of, of wilderness where predominantly all of these roads are, um, are definitely built for logging. Um, you know, and, that, and that's kind of why they're there. But yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful spot. I've just found this place here. It's well looked after, which is always a good sight sign you've got a little book there I might write in that and this is an absolutely lush spot I mean if when this is frozen you can walk out and just do some ice fishing and try and get to the deeper spots they call it pimpling here it's a nice nice pastime actually over the winter as long as it's not too windy and flipping really cold but anyway let's write something in this book um, dear Santa when I was a child all I had was the K's catalogue the lingerie section exclamation mark please could you send me a limited edition copy of razzle volume 7 that would be fantastic and it would make all my dreams come true Hey guys, Mike here. Welcome back to another video on the channel. A little bit of a colder one this time, about minus 13 degrees seen now, and it's dropping near or probably into the 20s tonight. So uh, it's going to be a cold one, but I'm about one hour east of where I live. I've been mostly on the main roads up until now, and uh, now I'm kind of on the back roads in this beautiful location. And this is an eco park called Eco Park Sharings Beriet. You probably noticed I've been here before and you may have seen it in previous videos. It's a beautiful place, but I've always visited it in the summer where it's nice and warm with 24 hour daylight. Now we get around about four hours daylight, if that. It's the darkest, coldest time of year now, but amazingly, there's actually very little snow. So it's great to uh, be able to come here and see it in this kind of beautiful winterized landscape. So um, I'm gonna get on my way find somewhere to camp because obviously I've only got about three hours of daylight left before it comes. of uh, 
a little cliff, well, I say little, it's quite a big cliff actually. You might remember I visited this place in the summer, and um, you know, it was the place where there was a few of those vipers, or adders as we call them in the UK, sort of knocking around. I don't think there'll be any around here now, but um, I wanted to check this place out just to see what it was like in the winter, because in the summer it's just a bog and the ground is very damp. So it'd be worth having a look at. Beautiful place. A little bit close to his cave. And I don't really want any visits in the night. can't hear a thing which is wonderful to be quite honest with you but these cliffs look incredible you've got some uh, ice forming just on the edge of the rocks and, and no hunters have been around here as there's no fresh tracks since the snowfalls come over the last week but uh, yeah a lot of elk a lot of fresh elk track as well in fact I'm sure I must have spooked one because there's a, a track just coming up here that looks like it's just been made basically as it's kicking the snow and trotting away as it's probably heard my flipping dinosaur coming up here but um anyway let's have a look around see if this is a nice place to camp so here we are at the base of the cliff there's a lot of dead standing wood around here for making fire and you know loads of nice big logs and medium sized ones and ice hanging down you can break that off and chuck it in a pot you don't have to collect lots of snow if you didn't bring any water with you or something so nice place but um i brought all my ice fishing equipment with me to fish and i don't know whether i want to um maybe come here another night i just get a bad feeling about this location like something's here waiting for me as the light reflects off the side of the cliff and makes it look so inviting but as night falls a new atmosphere takes hold and it comes out to play so that location was absolutely beautiful and um, you know spectacular place really um, but uh, I don't know I just some places just don't sit sit right with me uh, I just get a bit spooked you know call it paranoia call it a sixth sense call it diarrhea you know you can call it whatever you want but sometimes you go to places and and you just you're just like yeah i'm just something about this place is just not right i i, I want i need to go i need to leave so i'm i'm doing that um but i really want to camp there but i just can't ignore this voice in the back of my head could it be something primal could it be something instinctual? Could it be lack of breakfast? I might just need a cup of tea. I don't know, but one thing I was always told when I was young is always trust your gut. So I'm gonna go down to another place that is really beautiful and I'll get way more daylight there. And it's also on the edge of a lake with a beach and basically I can ice fish because I bought a fishing card for this location and I got all my fishing gear with me. I would like to have a go at that a few times before it gets dark. So, that's the plan. Just being honest.
If you listen to the ice when I was on it, it was making all kinds of groaning sounds. There's cracks everywhere. So uh, it's pretty damn thick, but I'm just going to test it, you know. You don't want to go walking all the way out there and... <laughs> you know what I mean? About three inches, it's not that thick, about three inches thick, so uh, you know, it'll support a lot of weight, it'll support my weight, but there's a few sort of dodgy patches around, you know, like patches that uh not iced over and stuff, a little bit over there, and yeah, it's just, it's just not quite late enough in the year really, or it's just not been that cold, the winter started off really mild, you know, now it's only really just started to get cold now, so um you know, it's all good. I mean, it's pretty damn deep here anyway. And the lake drop, drops off right here. And then it's about five metres just at that last hole. Which is good enough for a lot of small perch and that. But, yeah, I'll take it easy, I think. Anyway, let's get camp set up. We're expecting a bit of snowfall, so uh, I've got a little tarp that I'm going to set up at the back. And uh, obviously with winter in play, you have to bring quite a lot more equipment out with you. The snowshoes are a bit of an overkill, but when I pack the winter kit, I just put all the winter kit in and I leave it like that, so I never really forget anything. But if we add high winds and deep snow, instead of pegs, I use these anchors here. And I got poles and other such things, but Normal pegs should do, if I can get them in the ground enough. I was talking about in my last video how all the snow when it comes down just goes straight in the back of the draw system and it was driving me nuts. So I made a tarp system that can basically clip on the back like this So that's basically it. Um, it's not a brilliant design, uh, but it's just really all I could come up with with what I already had at home. Uh, there's another pole there too, if you wanted to uh, have another one here, for example. But what I might use this one for is put something on top of it 
and have the centre at the top pushed up when the hatch is bang. And then when snow really does land on it, it's not just going to collapse in the night because that's kind of the problem with the design. You know, as you bring that down, it all becomes a little bit sort of skewer. You probably need that one pulled out, but even then that's not gonna, gonna do you really any justice. So it works with the hatch open anyway. And the main thing is, is when I'm cooking and stuff, I just can't stand all the snow going in the back there and just getting everything saturated. So that's my excuse anyway. Basically, um, you know, I'm just justifying it to you. It's shit and it's the best I could do. Always forget how painful it is touching metal in these temperatures, but uh, sometimes you need dexterity. We've got a couple of pillows, and um, they're pillows in there. Not, it's not a blow-up device or anything. But um, I've got a um, pretty decent bag tonight. Got a Thermares Quest Star going down to minus 18. Should be good. It's a down bag, but uh, yeah, I'll see how I get on. Always put my uh, clothes bag up there. I'll get out my backpack. It's just my clothes for the next few days. Well, that's camp all set up. It's looking pretty smart. Hopefully the tent will be comfortable tonight, and nice and warm. Obviously I'll be sleeping without the diesel heater on because I don't like the sound of it. And my sleeping bag does go to a very low temperature. Um, and you know, I don't need the awning out because I've got this little bit at the back, which is primarily where I'll be living. And I'm gonna be staying outside pretty much the duration. I won't be going in the awning room and all that kind of stuff. For me, the awning room's useful for like the family. Um, but for me personally, I don't like it because when I come out camping, I like to be outside despite the weather. And if it's really cold, I'll just make a big fire, which is what I'm going to do tonight. Um, so that's basically the way I'm going to roll. Uh, but uh, anyway, I'm flipping dying for a cup of tea, as you probably, probably appreciate. bit close to the fire. It all must have been very cold. It's so cold I can barely take my gloves off and touch anything. It's not so much the ambient air, but you just touch a little bit of metal and the burn is intense. But I made a little bit of changes to the draw system, shed some weight, made it a little bit more multifunctional. So this is the camp table, if you remember, but now it's actually part of the draw system. The legs are still underneath, held in by a strap. 
and you just pull these two levers here and it slides out. So you can kind of use it on the fly like this or if you do want a camp table, it comes out and it can go somewhere when you've finished and you want to actually sit down and have a meal. Just a little bit of a weight saver instead of carrying layer upon layer of, of stuff really. I'm always trying to lighten the vehicle up to be honest. It is pretty heavy. I can't do anything with gloves on. But everything is so painful to hold. This guy's going to have to come in the tent with me tonight. I've been keeping it in the vehicle. But uh, even last time when it was minus four, it was all frozen around here. So I'd be amazed if it survived tonight when it's like minus 20. Jesus. that about? Some sort of whistling sound. Chill out. Flipping dog man probably heard that 25 miles away. Just called him in. I said I had a battery situation and I do. The, the River Pro is gone. Not because I want it to be gone but because um, I did something to it and, and I was updating it and, and messing around with it and, and I just I screwed it up somehow and it didn't turn back on so I got in touch with the guys and they were like look we'll arrange a pickup got a DHL label on it send it off and they're going to sort it out and send it back so no problems there but I'm back on my old leisure battery and with my old system completely ripped out to make room for the River Pro and a slightly different setup I've kind of got no way of charging the leisure battery so whatever juice it's got in it it's got in it and I maximum charged it and it's inside the vehicle but um Fingers crossed, it's enough juice, but it means the fridge can't be on. I would have it in warm mode in these temperatures, but everything I've put in here, hopefully it's keeping its own little climate going on and it's not gonna freeze. But I think tonight I might have to take all this food up in the roof tent with me. I know what you're thinking. Didn't he just light a stove with a lighter? Look, this is just my thing, all right? If I'm making a fire, I gotta stay true. The ice is shouting out, well done Mike. You did something you've done a thousand times.
Well, temperatures are really starting to drop off now, and the camera gear was the first bit of equipment to fall. Um, I've had it by the fire for probably about half an hour, just warming up the battery pack on the back of the tripod, trying to get it to come back alive again. Um, it can handle minus 20, but the problem is, is um, I, I turned it off and then it really cools down too much and it almost can't come back on again. So you have to leave it on all the time. It's a big insulated battery pack on the back of the tripod, but um, you know, when it's off for too long, it just cools off. So, you know, I had to put some layers on, another jacket, bigger gloves that go over the other gloves. You know, it's really, really gonna drop off and it's only two o'clock in the afternoon. So, um, feels like the evening, but it isn't. You know, and I forgot my copy of Razzle, so There's a big old stack of wood there that uh, someone's lovingly brought up here. This is a popular grilling spot, I think. Uh, I think families and stuff come here and, you know, it's just a nice, it's a really nice place. In the summer, it's great. You've got a beach, the kids can play. Max loves it here. I can't wait to bring him here next summer. Well, just before the flies kind of get real bad in the middle of summer, but uh, I need a fire for heat, really, because I'm just out here all the time. You know, there's a lot of people just come here and they cook food and that. So, um, you know, I just need to keep going gathering a lot more wood because I don't want to like disrespectfully burn through a stack of lovingly prepared logs that people used to make fire just for heat. So, um, yeah. This is how you have a conversation with the ice. It's been a few hours since I drilled this. There we go. That was clever. There's a lamp on the side of the camera, but again, it can't handle these kind of temperatures. It's gonna turn off in a sec, and uh, it might be pretty difficult for you to see what's going on in this continuously diminishing daylight, and soon it will be pretty damn dark. But, you know, I, I'm just kind of having a play around here. I don't, I don't believe that I will catch anything, and it's not really quite the right time of day, and the visibility's poor, it's getting colder, the fish are really gonna be slowing down, they're not gonna be feeding, but, I just thought I'd come out and do something considering it's three in the afternoon and it's already dark and you know that's another another part of sort of overlanding and camping and wild camping and whatever you call it you know there's a lot of downtime and there you go the light turned off and, and sometimes you do you do pull out a fish you know at this time and and you know no no two scenarios are the same I've got a flashing lure on it so the visibility is pretty good I know the water here to be pretty clear and it's the winter so usually a little bit clearer. So, um, you know, sometimes sometimes you just get lucky, but I thought I'd try my hand at it anyway. But but the point I'm making is, um, well, what I wanted to talk about was, 
it may seem really strange coming out and camping at this time of year when basically the thermometer is saying minus 20 degrees C. It gets dark at like three o'clock in the afternoon. So there's a tremendous amount of, of, of downtime. You know, what, what do you do? For me personally, I just get a tremendous amount of enjoyment and energy from just being out in nature, regardless of the time of year and the weather conditions. And I love the fact that it is so different to the summer. You know, 24 hour daylight, it's warm. You can swim in this lake, you can catch the edder. And I guess like my wife says to me, she says, I always see you come alive when you're being challenged, you know, physically or mentally. And, and, and that's it, isn't it? You know, you come out here and there's this challenge, physical challenge of your equipment and, and everything and yourself mentally, you've got to continue to think ahead you know in terms of preparations for the harsh weather conditions and you know you, you need to remain sort of mentally strong because it's dark and you might be yourself and you know Gollum's watching me and he's he's got a semi and he's just there he's lurking so you know it's it sort of taps into that animalistic instinct a bit in you but you know the darkness can be weird and uh, solo camping can be kind of freaky but it's all in your head there are there are threats though and you, and you have to you have to be prepared but you know that's on you isn't it that's on you and that's on you reading the environment and making sure that you pick a place that you know that feels good you do your research stuff like that you know if you just go and camp anywhere yeah, you know maybe some places aren't so good so uh, anyway, I just chatted a lot of crap again. The ice is talking. Forgot to put the maggots in my pockets. So They're probably all freezing to death. Time for some dinner, and it's going to be leftover chilli that I made yesterday for dinner, but I do have plenty. So instead of spending more money, make use of the leftovers. Uh, and I don't think I'll cook on the fire because I've just made some gigantic fire for warmth, and that should hopefully all build up and keep me warm tonight. But I'm going to be cooking on the white gas on the motor. And I've uh, got to go. Yes.
There we go. Warm my feet up a little bit. Because they are cold. Well, temps have uh, continued to drop and it's about minus 22 degrees C now. So it's extremely cold and uh, you can probably hear in my voice that, you know, it's kind of got into me a little bit. I've had some technical failures. The diesel heater isn't going to work tonight. The battery just can't, can't do it. I even tried running the engine and having wires going to the the other battery to charge it and also try and jump start the diesel heater and then switch it over to another battery which I've managed to do before in the past but I just don't have the gear to make that happen as I didn't anticipate that to fail that badly so I, uh, I have my minus 20 sleeping bag up there and I've had to move the food back into the to the fridge and uh Hopefully that'll insulate it and just close the car off and stuff. So yeah, there'll be no heat tonight. And um, I'm going to need to go up in the tent now and uh, get into my sleep system basically because I'm, I'm obviously losing a lot of body heat now. Uh, but uh, yeah, I just wanted to catch that, that display of the Northern Lights. Hopefully you enjoyed it as much as I did. You probably saw it better than me on the camera given the GoPro uh, setup here has much better light sensitivity than than the human eye so well the shutter exposure basically but so uh, yeah a beautiful night but the, the 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 lake is making some bizarre noises it seems to have quietened down but maybe that's just because I can't shut up Uh, yeah, anyway, I need to get warm, so uh, I'll see you in the morning. <laughs> Hopefully you can see me all right. I'm just up inside the roof tent. They've been up here for about an hour and a half now, uh, just hunkered down inside the sleeping bag. Pretty warm um, as far as the the bag is around me. Um, and I also have some other blankets and stuff up here and it's it's obviously a pretty good bag I've used it before on the ground and stuff but um, not not in this context up in a rooftop tent with this particular sleep mat so the difficulty I'm having is um, I'm on a th I'm on an Xbed Mega Mat Duo 10 which has an R value of 8.2 from memory so that's an ambient air temperature rating of around 
which should be around minus 35, minus 40 degrees C. Um, but unfortunately, in this particular rooftop tent, in this setup, it's uh, resulting in the sleep mat being extremely cold like like I can feel freezing cold air coming through the mat and, and just kind of stripping the mat of its of its of its thermal of its warmth basically so unfortunately it's two below and one above you know if you've ever I mean I've backpacked for years and, and it's so much more important to have what's underneath you rather than what's on top of you i mean what's what's on top of me is great but i i'm freezing from the underneath like literally it's it's cutting through me and it's sort of really cutting into me quite bad actually so i don't know whether it's this rooftop tent because i mean it has no floor it just has fabric but you see i have the fabric then i have a sheet of wood and then i have um which in itself is quite thermally efficient and then i have sort of a layer of carpet which which functions as a condensation mat and then I have the bag that the mattress is in and then the mattress and then I'm also on a blanket and then I'm in my sleeping bag with then another blanket over the top of me um, so I would have thought that would be okay but it, it isn't working it is freezing like from the underneath like not not around me and not on top but you know, if you've ever if you've ever camped and backpacked and stuff, and you know you've been on a on a really cold mat, it doesn't matter whether you're in an incredible sleeping bag, the mat will let you down and you will freeze and it will be a terrible night. So, given that it's minus twenty two degrees C and um, it's not even uh, sort of ten o'clock at night yet, I I I might have to actually call this um, and pack up which I'm which I'm super disappointed about. I mean, if you know me and the sort of stuff I like to do, then I you know, this will be the first camp I've I've called flipping out pro probably in the last 15 16 years actually. Um you know, but I I just haven't experienced this temperature in this setup before. You know, so this is the first time I've used this mat. You can hear it in my voice. It's 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 cutting into me bad. So I'm gonna see how it goes, uh, and then you know we'll we'll see. But yeah, there we go. Gutted actually. I have to rethink the setup. So um, I think probably all all that I'd need is a thick layer of foam underneath the sleep mat. And it'll probably be golden, but, you know, I don't have that out here. <laughs> so there we go. But, you know, you've got to have these experiences anyway, right? So as you can see, I'm not in the rooftop tent anymore. Um, I'm back in the Jeep and I'm leaving this place, which is really, really unfortunate. But basically the last shot you've seen of me was probably around nine o'clock. When I, when, when I started to really notice the, the mattress kind of freezing up on me. Um, at that point, I've only really just managed to get the camera gear working, by the way, and it's half past three in the morning. So I gave it a good go, really, to try and get the setup to work in these temperatures, but, it, but it's extremely cold, you know, it's minus 22 degrees C, and it's just a very, it's very difficult, difficult temperature range, really, to try and make that setup work now now I can see the problems with it in these temperatures so you know at that time around nine I basically put all my clothes on again and I uh, jumped out of the roof tent stoked up the fire warmed up my body temperature um, had a little bit to eat and basically uh, revisited the roof tent so I lifted the mattress and what I've got is I've got the X-Bed Mega Mat Duo which is R rated at 8.2, so that should be around minus 40, but obviously it's suspended in the air in a roof tent with no floor, so that there's the problem really. And I did use that mattress in the last roof tent in the front runner, one point a featherlight 1.3 in minus 18, and it was okay. So I know it's really to do with the lack of floor in this rooftop tent basically that's the issue. 
or it shouldn't be a surprise, but it, but it also is in some way, um, because I kind of thought I had enough insulation underneath the mattress to kind of make up for that lack of a floor. But basically I have the mattress, I have a sheet of two mil wood, and I have like, well, about sort of four to five mil of carpet underneath the mattress. And, um, you know, I sort of thought that would be enough basically. Um, and, and then you have the material of the roof tent, which is a sort of some thin kind of like nylon material basically. And then there's just air. So there's nothing else under the tent than that. Um, so what I did is I, I took the blankets I had, which, which are like kind of like two thin duvets really. And I put those underneath the mattress to try and give it more lofting. So they were in between the wood and the condensation mat carpet thing. And, and, and the actual X bed mat. So, you know, I just wanted to sort of give it a little bit more lofting, see whether I could kind of take the edge off of this, uh, this cold that was creeping through. And then I put my mattresses underneath my sleeping bag. Sorry, my jackets, both of them. And I slept pretty much fully clothed in the sleeping bag. And the sleeping bag is, is it rated to like minus, I think 18. So it's extremely, it's extremely good you know I've got lots of thermal layers on underneath as well so it shouldn't really be an issue and um, you know I, I went back to sleep and, uh, and I actually went to sleep and then I woke up at around I think it was about half past two in the morning and then uh, you know the mattress was just absolutely freezing it was just freezing cold um, it, not me not like the air around me in the sleeping bag and stuff I was warm within the sleeping bag but underneath me it was like I was lying on the ground outside it was absolutely freezing so I guess it held up for a while but eventually that cold air just got through and just and just kind of got me basically and it ended up freezing me and waking me up which is just what happens I mean I'm no stranger to backpacking I'm no stranger to bushcraft and camping and sleeping rough you know, but, but minus 22 degrees C and those kind of conditions are they're, they're pretty they're pretty difficult to to sort of like tough it through the night if you understand what I mean you know you can, you can tough it through the night I've done it many times you know especially when I was younger I couldn't afford good gear and everything but yeah I just it's very difficult to do that in, in those kind of temperatures so I decided to call it you know got warmed up again with the fire Bigfoot came along he did keep me warm uh, quite a while actually but um, I hope you enjoyed this video you know um, and uh, you know obviously if you have any advice please write it in the description below you know I'm not one of these people who's like butt hurt by people sort of you know with more experience than me sort of you know shining a light on sort of my flaws and that you know just just you know go for it and um you know i'll just delete your comment but thanks for watching i'll <laughs> i'll see you again soon take care oh bigfoot's ringing me again god mate honestly you give it you give him an inch and it's just so needy so needy i'm just gonna hang up on him